Bilal, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so I've just shared a slide. Um, one note with the slide that I shared, uh, they don't have videos, um, but it's not a big problem because I'm going to tell you where you can find uh, videos of agents, um, I mean, playing Atari games. So if you go to slides um, nine, just click on that link and you will have a website right there where you where you will have a playlist here of uh, an agent playing all the 57 Atari games uh, and the agent play them uh, at higher level than an average human. So yeah, I mean, just choose the game you would like to see and uh, you can look at those videos. Okay. Um, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, super cool. Um, pop up. Okay, so, um, so for this afternoon, um, it's going to be uh, uh, less technically involved than this morning. Uh, what I want to do for uh, 45 minutes is just to uh, give you a tour of what has been done from uh, 2015, so the publication of the Nature paper uh, to, uh, I mean, to, to 2020, let's say. Also, I would like to insist that <clears throat> between uh, the DQN paper, the workshop paper in 2013 and the um, uh, Nature paper 2015, there have been uh, two years, so, I mean, if you are starting a PhD and uh, you are a little bit discouraged because uh, you are not able to publish a paper uh, in six months, it's totally normal. Sometimes it takes two, three years to uh, publish a paper. Okay, so now let's take a little tour of uh, the literature around the seminal paper, DQN. So first of all, um, here there is a list of all the improvements, but if you want to have, uh, uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, involved uh, lecture on that topic, you can click to that link. It will uh, lead you to a blog post about uh, beating the Atari benchmark. And you will have like maybe a better presentation, better figures of what we are talking about when we say we want to beat the average human on Atari games. And also here you will have a nice graph of what are the different uh, improvements. So, um, <clears throat> so there is some uh, algorithmic improvements, uh, adding memory, uh, uh, playing with exploration algorithm, uh, also using meta controller to uh, optimize some hyperparameters, like for instance, the gamma uh, for the uh, classical uh, Bellman equation. Okay. So now um, let's look at all those improvements uh, one by one. So uh, algorithmic improvements. So uh, there have been some tweaks on the Bellman equation. So uh, this is the case of the double DQN. Uh, one question this morning was about uh, how can we uh, basically take the best data from the replay and the, the answer to that is the prioritized replay uh, technique. Uh, also, some people have been uh, very interested in uh, not only as it is done in classical DQN and also in classical RL to look at the expectation over uh, the expected sum of reward, but to look at the entire distribution. So understanding the entire uh, random variable that's the um, uh, discounted return. And this is called distributional RL. Then, um, so those are all algorithmic tricks. They don't depend on the architecture or the agent itself. You have more uh, deep learning uh, improvements, such as the fact that we can use a different architecture than the classical one. You can also have different ways to collect data. And this is what we call the distributed setting, where we have a lot of factors collecting data and give it to the uh, uh, replay buffer. And also, as we have seen this morning, we need to solve the problem of partial observability. So one thing that we could do 
is to add memory to the agent. And of course, we're gonna also quickly see uh, what are the exploration mechanisms that are used uh, uh, today in modern deep reinforcement learning. So it's gonna be quick because this is an entire literature of papers on, on that particular topic. And finally, we'll see how that we can also optimize parameters uh, differently from a gradient descent uh, with other algorithms like bandits, meta gradient or population-based training. So uh, yeah, this is uh, what we're gonna see step-by-step. Step. Uh, do not hesitate if you have question to ask them uh, because we are not going to go uh, too deep uh, in each one, we are mainly going to do a tour of those. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's start with double DQM. Um, so I really encourage you uh, for each of those methods, I put some material here. So uh, those are the links to the paper. So if you really want to understand uh, uh, this topic, read the paper. Uh, those are uh, quite nice actually. So I really encourage you to, to do it. So what's the, the problem with, with Q-learning? Um, be, because uh, all the algorithms that we use are doing expectation over uh, a set of, of uh, data, um, the expectation is never uh, basically uh, <clears throat> uh, really, um, understood in the sense that we, we don't estimate it correctly. And when you don't estimate uh, an expectation and you take a max over it, uh, something that could happen is uh, what we call overestimation of the targets. So um, in order to avoid that, um, there is a simple trick that you can do is to do what we call the disentanglement uh, between the estimation of the Q values and uh, the choice of the maximum. So how we do that in practice, uh, this is a very easy trick. Uh, what you can do is use the target for uh, the estimation of the Q value as we, as we, as we did, but you don't use the, the, the target network for uh, the choice of the max action like we did with the QN, but instead use the online network. And uh, that way uh, you're going to decouple the two things and you will be uh, less biased. In order to prove that property, uh, you should read the papers. I'm not going to do that here, but uh, here is the simple change in the algorithm. So here uh, is the target that you, that you uh, compute at time k for uh, the data j, the transition j, which is rj plus gamma max of the q value for the target network. So here you're just going to replace uh, the max over uh, those actions for the target with uh, another action. And this other action is the arg max, not over the target, but over the online network. So it's a simple trick uh, and it, it uh, leads to uh, better results than uh, the QN. Um, so uh, there was a question this morning on, okay, uh, we may have um, very, very few transition uh, that are interesting. Uh, and on which I would like to, uh, to learn and bootstrap my algorithm. So uh, one way to uh, allow uh, that uh, is uh, what we call prioritize experience uh, replay. So what you're gonna do is you're going to give some priority to a transition in the replay. And those priority are going to be based on uh, the temporal difference error. So what is the temporal difference error? It's very, it's very simple. It's simply here, you remember this is uh, uh, TGK, your target, and this is your function that you would like to fit to your target. So you just are going to look at, okay, how far I am to my target. And if I'm far, it means that I need to change my network because I don't really understand uh, the, uh, the Bellman update. So those are the very interesting uh, uh, transition to look at. So basically the priority is just going to be uh, this absolute value of the temporal difference plus some epsilon because uh, you don't want to have um, priority zero if your T0 is zero. And when you have priorities over uh, a batch of data, this is very simple to uh, compute probabilities. 
the probability is simply going to be uh, the priority divided by the sum of probability over all the data sets. So here you can ask, why do we have this alpha here? So the alpha is uh, just an exponent that allows you to go from a fully uh, prioritized replay if you put alpha to one, to completely uniform replay if you put alpha to, uh, to, uh, to zero. You will get one over n in that case. Okay, but even if you have the good uh, uh, priority setup, you still need to reweight uh, uh, your loss because the loss is uh, an expectation that you would like to compute. And because you are not selecting your data uniformly, uh, the expectation is not going to be correctly uh, weighted. So you need to do important sampling in order to have the good expectation. So here, uh, it's we have a little bit of voodoo. It's not exactly important sampling. Uh, if if you wanted to do important sampling, you just need to have the weight n times the probability power minus one, which is the correct one. But uh, in the paper, they saw that experimentally, uh, uh, this weight works better than the correct one theoretically. So uh, yeah, just take a look to the paper. Uh, the idea is quite simple. Uh, use the, the data on which you don't understand uh, the update in order to uh, to uh, get better estimation of your Q value. Okay. Uh, we have a small question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me. So uh, Dennis what is is uh, asking is the online network what is sometimes called the behavior policy. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, that's a good question. From the online network, uh, which is uh, Q theta you can derive the behavior policy, okay? So by taking the argmax of uh, the action, uh, uh, the state action Q value on that point. So just take the argmax and then you can get the behavior policy. So there is a little tweak. So the behavior policy is uh, that argmax. So what we call the greedy policy plus uh, some, uh, some, uh, some noise. So let's say a random policy. Uh, in order to have an agent that is uh, not purely deterministic. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so now um, let's go uh, to um, what we called a uh, change of architectures. And uh, in particular, uh, what so the main idea um, uh, with that algorithm is to try to decompose the value into a state dependent part and an action dependent, a state action and de uh, dependent part. So uh, why uh, do we want to do that? Um, because uh, most of the time uh, actions are not taken uh, uh, by uh, the behavioral policy. So when you take an argmax or q theta, most of the time, the argmax or what you call the greedy action is going to be taken. So you are not going to be very good at evaluating this action, uh, the other actions. So in order to uh, not make too much mistake, what you're going to do is you're going to divide the Q value um, in two things, the value function, so a state dependent part, and uh, what we call the advantage, which is a state uh, and action dependent part. So at least on the action that you don't evaluate, the value will be estimated correctly. So that's a, a nice property. And then what is also nice when you uh, decompose uh, your Q value into those two things is that you will be focused more uh, on how to make a good ranking between actions because you will learn uh, more specifically uh, this, uh, uh, this advantage uh, uh, function. And that advantage uh, function will tell you how good you are uh, compared to another one. Uh, and here you can see that uh, you take over the average. So you really focus on the part of the signal uh, that is interesting, which is the ranking. And when you do the sum of those two things, you, get, you go back to a Q value. So it's a very simple trick. Uh, here you can see the, the difference in architecture. Uh, you have this almost the same number of weights between the two network but uh, a way better um, estimation of the, at least uh, estimation of the ranking of action doing uh, that dwelling uh, trick. 
And now, uh, one of the final uh, improvements uh, that has been done in terms of uh, architecture and, um, and algorithm uh, in the last few years uh, in this uh, DQN adventure is what we call distributional RL. So here I just gave you uh, three papers. One of them is a blog that explain you uh, what is distributional RL, what are the two types of distributional RL, so mainly categorical and uh, quantile uh, distributional uh, RL. And basically, I mean, it's quite easy to, uh, to, uh, to understand what distributional RL is doing. It's exactly the same than uh, a normal RL. In uh, normal RL, what you do is you estimate uh, the expectation and then you act according to, uh, to the expected discount return. But with distributional RL, you're not going to estimate the expectation of the discounted return. You're going to really uh, directly learn the distribution of the expected discounted return, but still you're going to act according to the expected discounted return because this is the optimal way to act. So why do we want to learn the full distribution and not only the expectation? Because it seems like it is a natural way uh, uh, to learn better about the task. Um, so uh, when you do that, you will learn in some cases, uh, I have 10% chance to be very bad, but 90% chance to be very good. And the fact that you know that helps your uh, neural network to have better presentation learning on the task. Uh, so it's a natural way uh, to have uh, what we call an auxiliary task. So uh, I, I'm just going to give you some notation. Uh, it may help you uh, in, in, uh, when you are reading those paper. Uh, so we don't talk about Q value, we talk about returns. So the returns is simply uh, the expected uh, discounted uh, reward uh, over the future. So uh, you look at that as a random variable and then the distributional Bellman operator is also almost like the one we have seen, except that is reward plus gamma. Uh, the discounted return for uh, now, it's not the next state, but you see the next state as a random variable, but, uh, and you don't take the max because here you're going to act a respective to the expectation. So you're gonna take the argmax of the expectation of Z on the next state as an action. And this is simply the, the Bellman operator. So now in order to apply those things, you just need to have a way um, to estimate uh, those returns. And basically uh, there is no secret uh, when you want to learn uh, uh, the distribution of a real random variable, what you need to learn is what we call the cumulative distributive function, which is just uh, the probability of the random variable to be uh, under a given threshold, little x. And as uh, in uh, integration theory, uh, when we learn integration theory, we have Riemannian integration or uh, Lebesgue integration. This is the same way with distribution RL. So either you're gonna look at the problem uh, by trying to learn the probabilities, or you're going to learn the problem by learning the quantiles. So the same way as integration, you have two, approach, uh, two approaches to, to that problem. Uh, and for categorical approach, basically what you're going to try to learn is you're going to do some experiments. So you're going to run your policy, uh, see how much return you get from that policy, and uh, basically take the expectation over uh, that experiment that tells you, is my return uh, bigger or uh, smaller than some uh, uh, threshold X? And then by taking the expectation, you will learn the probabilities. So you, now you can uh, estimate uh, 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 Z because you have the cumulative distribution. And you could also that uh, with the quantile approach. So I just uh, give you a reminder of what is a quantile. This is simply the inverse function of uh, the cumulative distribution function. And the secret to learn quantile is with quantile regression. Uh, just look it up on uh, Wikipedia. It's a very, interest, very interesting algorithm. Uh, I will encourage you to, uh, to look into that. So that's why I'm not uh, putting the algorithm there. So you can uh, lo lo look it up yourself. So uh, very interesting way. So basically there is no secret in distributional RL. Uh, the difference between uh, this and normal DQN is just how you learn the distribution. 
Okay, and uh, as you have seen this morning, uh, we have shown you the DQN Zoo code base. Uh, and in the DQN Zoo code base, you have all the algorithms that are uh, already coded for you. So you can run them and you can really see uh, how those different improvements uh, are making DQN way, way better. So uh, for instance, uh, just with IQN, which is the implicit quantile uh, distribution R algorithm, you get uh, maybe three or four times better than, than DQN on Atari games. And one thing that I have to say is IQN actually doesn't use any prioritize or double uh, DQN trick. This is just uh, uh, using distributional RL with a simple replay. So uh, we have great results doing that. And finally, the, there is this uh, black line, which is the rainbow algorithm that combines all uh, the improvements in those algorithms. And uh, you can see that uh, not only you can use each algorithm, each improvement by itself, but you can combine them and get uh, even better performance. Okay, so, um, um, and finally, uh, there is also another result that is quite nice uh, on the algorithmic side, which is basically the, the difference between classical deep RL and distributional RL, where you can see that since 2017, the best algorithm on a single agent uh, thread are distribution RL agents, and they take off compared to a classical uh, deep RL algorithm. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe I can uh, take some question uh, before going to the uh, distributed agent. So we have one question. We had another question, but it was answered by uh, Antonin Raffin. Okay. The question is, I'm wondering what is the problem with the base? If you have a base estimator that has a low variance, the selection of the of Q value has to be the same of the optimal policy, isn't it? I'm wondering what is the problem with the bias? So, so when you say, uh, I'm wondering what's the problem with the bias is when you're doing, for instance, uh, <clears throat> The Bellman update, uh, I assume, uh, you have a bias estimator. Yes, you have a bias estimator that has low variance, exactly. So, okay, so, and of the same. Okay. So, okay, so uh, I'm going to answer uh, not on the second part of the question, but the first part of the question where uh, the talk about the bias. So you're right, there, there is a bias, uh, a, a clear bias, because if you if you want to uh, to have a lower bias, you want to do like a Monte Carlo approach, but then if you do a Monte Carlo approach, so for those who don't know Monte Carlo approach is that you take uh, the, the full return, you don't use the Q in order to, um, to bootstrap the information of the future. Uh, but when you do that, uh, you, you have a lot of uh, variance because you have so many trajectories possible uh, that you cannot compute them all. So when you take uh, the expectation of those, you will have a huge variance. So all of those are, are, are true. And one way to avoid that uh, in DQN is some people are doing what we call end-step bootstrap. So instead of taking reward plus gamma Q, we take uh, some of the reward for n step, then gamma q at step n plus one. So this is one way to um, basically uh, have uh, less bias, but more variance. So we, we do this trade off. Okay, so this is uh, one part of the question. Are the same of the, yes. Yes, I mean, uh, because the argmax of the Q value is the optimal policy at the time being. So I would okay. say yes. So we have two other questions. Actually, a third one is popping up. Just tell me when you want to, to move on to the... Okay, how does these improvements from percentile translate to non-conventional benchmark outside of in video games? Okay, that's a very good question. So uh, those algorithms have been tested on the control suite too. Uh, so control suite is uh, a Mujoko based uh, environment. So 
So it's it's like a you know um, simulation of robotic arms, for instance, that type of things, and they are uh, basically translating quite well on those too. And so if you want to look at the paper doing exactly what I'm saying, this is a D4 PG paper that you that use uh, distributional RL and some of the tricks like prioritize replay for those tasks and compare them to classical uh, RL algorithm. Great so think, for, the, for, for Pablo. <laughs> so yeah, I think Pablo, it's okay. And then Q-learning algorithm is internally used in DQN. Okay, uh, okay. So in, in the presentation this morning, I, I really um, try to not use the term Q-learning and SARSA. I really wanted to value iteration algorithm where I use uh, T-star, so the optimal Bellman operator uh, uh, in there, and a regression to uh, replace uh, the optimal Bellman operator estimation. So I see DQN that way. So uh, now, if you talk about SARSA, it's more like an evaluation approach. So in that case, you should use uh, a policy improvement uh, type of approach. So it's not exactly DQN, it's close to DQN. So one thing that you could do is uh, policy improvements and then have uh, another network, which is a policy network on which you do uh, the improvement step. So by, for instance, uh, trying to fit the, uh, the optimal, the argmax of the actual Q value that is estimated. So in that case, it will not be a, a purely DQN algorithm, it will be uh, an actor critic approach with Sarsa. So do you think it's okay as an answer, David? Yeah, he has no, no way to answer, so okay. let's see so. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The control benchmark, okay, let me write it down. So I, I think it's D4. So if you look D4 PG like this, or maybe plus reinforcement learning, if you Google that, you should find it. Okay, great, thank you. Perfect. Uh, sorry if I was not clear on the answers. Um, okay. Um, uh, now there is a, a little bit uh, change of paradigm, let's say, in order to uh, get to the algorithm uh, with the best performance, which are complete, I mean, this is not algorithmic. This is really looking at the architecture and how we can uh, basically uh, get more data from the environment uh, and do more learning steps. So this is uh, what we call the uh, distributed setting where we completely decouple the learning part of the algorithm and the acting uh, or the data collection. So this is also what I was trying to show this morning. Um, the DQN algorithm has two parts. One part, which is acting with an epsilon greedy policy and the other part, which is learning, which is the neural FTQ algorithm. So here we're going to push uh, this idea a little bit more uh, we're going to have uh, hundreds of actors that are going to collect data in the environment, uh, send that data uh, with some priorities, uh, if we use, uh, for instance, prioritized replay, to a big replay buffer. The replay buffer basically can handle millions of transition. So it's like a huge memory of what has been done in the past. So this is what we call the agent experience. And then uh, uh, the replay buffer with some priority is going to send data to the learner and the learner is going to update the priorities when the data is used and send it back. So uh, the learner has all that data. Uh, the learner can be uh, one, four, 16 uh, GPUs, uh, TPUs, uh, anything uh, that use all that data and just take the gradient step in order to uh, update. Uh, its weight internally, and at some point uh, it will send the new uh, network weights that are updated to the actors, so it can collect different data. <clears throat> One other arch architectural um, step that has been done in deep learning um, 
is the fact that we don't want to use what we call um, feed forward network anymore uh, because we have a lot of environments uh, that have this partial observability property. We want to be able to handle those. So um, here, th this is the paper where you can look at, uh, at it. This is R2D2 paper that introduce uh, working memory into, uh, into a DQN. Um, so here, this is the classical DQN that we have. We have an observation. Uh, we pass this observation through a convolutional network because generally the observation is an image. So convolutional network are good to uh, handle uh, uh, 2D images. And then we have on top some uh, feed forward neural network. That's the Q value head. So instead of doing that, we are going to pass information from step to step with what we called a cell memory. So in that case, the cell memory is a long short term memory, but it could be any RNN cell. I mean, we, it doesn't have to be an LSTM. So uh, basically the idea uh, uh, in the RNN is you're gonna take uh, information of a previous time step. So here, OT minus two and AT minus three. You're going to compress that information in the cell and send it back, uh, uh, send it further, uh, one step further to the next step and use the uh, output of the cell to train the Q head. So you see uh, that way you can propagate the information that is far in the past into the future and learn uh, uh, to compress the history. So now when you're going to train uh, this neural network to, uh, to minimize your loss, uh, the, uh, the RNN is going to keep only the information uh, that is interesting in the past to be better at minimizing the loss. So hopefully the representation that you get should be uh, a way to compress the information in the past or select the interesting information in the past to be good uh, at time step T. So this is the, 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 the principle uh, of uh, working memories. So quite simple. And what you can see when you uh, basically add this working memory on top of a distributed setting is you get an incredible boost of performance. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here are the performance in, term, in terms of training time. So of course, uh, the R2D2 has not the same compute power as for instance, a DQN uh, um, agent mainly because it has a lot of factors uh, that send data to, uh, to a, a GPU learner. And you can see in 120 hours, uh, you get maybe 10, 20 times better than uh, the DQN in terms of, of this uh, metric of performance that we use in Atari games, which is how good you, uh, in median terms, uh, you are good in, uh, in, in those Atari games. So uh, yeah, uh, it's basically changed completely uh, the games in terms of performance. Uh, but also what you could see here is in terms of uh, environment frames that you take, you are not so good. Um, so basically you lose a lot in what we call data efficiency, but if the data is uh, very cheap in the environment, you can see that uh, as soon as uh, you uh, collect hundred times more uh, data in the environment, the performance uh, is uh, skyrocketing. Uh, so if you have compute, uh, using distributed setting are uh, way better uh, than uh, simple uh, single actor settings. Sorry, okay. we have a simple question. Yeah. Uh, is R2D2 Markovian? So what, what do you mean by uh, Markovian? Actually, I don't know. It's, it was Lowe's question. Okay. And actually, Louis uh, answered a little. Okay. Okay, um, Marco, Mar Markovian uh, in the sense that uh, it uses only the, the information at time uh, step T. No, because it has a uh, working memory. So in that sense, uh, I mean, I, I don't like to uh, use the term Markovian because Markovian is more a term that you will use for the environment. Um, so is an environment Markov or not, for instance? Uh, in the case of Atari games, uh, it's not really the case. You have some partial observability in Atari games. So that's why we need those uh, uh, working memory uh, type of agent to deal with that partial observability. Okay, thank you.
Okay. So now um, exploration, uh, <clears throat> which is also uh, a big um, a big field uh, in reinforcement learning where uh, you can find a lot of ways to improve the, the classical DQN. So uh, as I said, uh, there is this acting part and the learning part. The acting part uh, of any reinforcement learning uh, algorithm is about collecting information. Uh, and this is exploration. I think that uh, Matteo uh, will do a presentation on that uh, during the this summer school. So also encourage you to uh, to go and look at this presentation. But in a few uh, in a in a few words, um, we have mainly two trends in deep reinforcement learning uh, on exploration. Um, so the first trend is about estimating uncertainties uh, on, on on the world. And what you're going to do is, if you are uncertain about, about some part of the world, what you want to do is to go back there in order to uh, refine your model of the world and, and collect information where you, you, you don't have uh, information at, at, at the first, at the beginning of, of, the, of the learning. So now there are different types of uncertainties that you can look at. The first one is what we call state uncertainty. And um, the random network distillation paper uh, basically uh, answered that question. So what is state uncertainty is, have you been there or not? So uh, if uh, the, the state is not familiar to you, you will say, okay, I'm uncertain there. I need maybe to come back again and try to understand it better. You have what we call future uncertainty uh, with the very famous prediction error algorithm. And future uncertainty is just telling you so if I'm in this state and I do some action, how, how am I good at predicting the next frame? So uh, if you are good at it, you don't have too much future uncertainty. If you are bad at it, uh, you have a lot of future uncertainty. So you want to, to go there in order to, uh, to be better at estimating uh, this uncertainty. You have also what we call model uncertainty, which basically look at the disagreement of uh, different models of future predictions, for instance. And finally, you have value uncertainty, which tells you how much you don't know about the Q value in that given state. And in order to do that, what you could do is uh, simply look at the standard uh, deviation of uh, uh, your value for a given state and try to, uh, to minimize that or understand it better. So this is one, one thing on, uh, on exploration, one side of uh, the exploration uh, field. Another trend is what we call entropy maximization, which is even more basic uh, than estimating the uncertainty in the world. And it consists just in trying to go everywhere. So uh, go in as many states as you can. So to do that, you need to have a way to estimate the entropy uh, uh, that you have on, on the environment uh, and maximize it. So uh, different ways of doing that. At the level of the episode, uh, which we call episodic entropy maximization. So this is the never give up paper, for instance. But you could also do global entropy maximization. And you could look at this new paper, geometric entropic maximization, that, that does that for you. But uh, once again, this is an entire field of reinforcement learning. So uh, a lot of work has been done uh, there and still ongoing. So maybe to make uh, things more clear, I'm going to uh, present you one of this uh, exploration uh, method. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that, that we do for, for exploration is to go to uh, new interesting states. But one thing that is very, very complex in, uh, in exploration and in RL in general is to have a notion of distance between states. Because if I give you two images, um, it's quite hard to understand, okay, um, my agent, is my agent seeing those two images differently? Should I have like a pixel loss between those two images? Maybe I have a lot of noise in one image and not on the other. So if I have a pixel loss, I will have a, a big error, but I have just noise in my image. So what you would like to do is to have a notion of, de of distance uh, that is meaningful. So in some kind of uh, high level uh, space, so this high-level space 
we call that uh, the uh, the feature at the the feature level. So you want to build good feature level in which you're going to measure distance between your states uh, in order to measure uh, uh, an entropy. So how do we build um, those features uh, for uh, exploration? So one thing that we, we, we like, we seek as a property of those algorithm is to have what we call controllable states, or at least states where um, uh, where the, all the features are maybe controllable by the agent. So one way to easily uh, compute those features is uh, solving the following problem, which is uh, simply estimating the action between two frames. Why doing so is interesting, because if you are able to estimate what was the action between two frames, what you will encode in your embedding is mostly what help you estimate the action. So if, for instance, this uh, little player is moving, so uh, uh, you can, and basically the, the player moving uh, is corresponding to an action, what your network will learn is to put more weight on uh, the little player. If you take the key, okay, the key will disappear. So it's an action taken by you to make disappear a key. The key will appear on those uh, features because those are controllable features. But Let's say you have a lot of background background noise in your image. They are not useful to predict the next action. So they may be filtered by this method. So it's quite interesting just by this very simple trick, you can have uh, very nice features that are meaningful uh, to do uh, exploration. Then uh, this method uh, that computes uh, a bonus for exploration is quite simple. You just basically going uh, to collect a lot of data and uh, for uh, one new data, you're going to say, OK, is that data uh, new or not? And in order to uh, answer that question, you're just going to take the k nearest neighbors in uh, the past episode that you have seen. And you're going to compute uh, uh, the distance between the k nearest neighbor and this new state. So if this distance is very, very important, it means that you have no k nearest neighbors that are close to you to the state. So it means that the state is completely new. So you want to go there. So you're going to take the inverse of, uh, of uh, that thing as, uh, as a way to, uh, as a way to uh, basically uh, uh, reward your agent to go to the states where the distance between the k nearest neighbor and the new state is, is big, simply. So very, uh, very simple method to uh, basically uh, train your agent to uh, optimize a novelty. So uh, on top of that novelty uh, tracking, we, uh, uh, in the Never Give Up paper, they add uh, an R&D uh, type of uh, uh, method. And as I told you, R&D measure the state uncertainty. So as a whole, it will tell you, have you been or not to that state? And when you uh, combine those two rewards with a multiplicative modulation, uh, you get uh, very nice results uh, from exploration. For instance, you can solve uh, those games like Montezuma in Atari and so on. So the final trick that is uh, used uh, more and more in uh, reinforcement learning is what we call meta controller. So here I wanted to show you that uh, this big octopus is the one that is going to change a little bit the hyperparameters of your algorithm. So um, what are the hyperparameters of the algorithm that we can think of? Um, we can think of, of the discount factor. Uh, we can think, for instance, on how much you're going to mix the extrinsic reward and the intrinsic reward that your exploration mechanism is giving you. Um, you can think, uh, I don't know, on, on a lot of uh, different things. Uh, the actor update period, uh, lots of hyperparameters. And because those things are not directly related to uh, optimizing the neural network, what you want is to have what we call the meta controller that is going to change those hyperparameter uh, at a different scale than uh, we change the, the parameters of the neural network. So the, the way to train those is to use uh, the episode score, for instance, as a reward. And you can use, I don't know, a bandit algorithm. You could use population-based training uh, and so on to optimize those uh, parameters. 
So finally, uh, when we have all those things, uh, what do we do? So I told you that there is a rainbow uh, paper that basically uh, mixes um, the, the, the improvements uh, from uh, architecture and uh, algorithmic uh, point of view. And then uh, recently there is this Agent 57 that is going to take all those improvements in terms of distributed actors, episodic uh, memory, working memory, exploration, meta controller, and is going to create an agent that is basically able to, uh, uh, to solve all the games. Um, so here, uh, this is what you can see. You have the number of games that are uh, basically um, better than humans. And uh, this agent is able to uh, to get there finally at the end, uh, and it plateaus, of course, to uh, all the games uh, in the in the Atari uh, suite. One thing that you could see is that uh, in this graph is that most of the games. So here, uh, this is the uh, the human normalized scores. Um, most of the games are solved uh, on on basically. Uh, the first 100 million of frames. You have only six games that are uh, uh, difficult to solve. And here uh, at the end, uh, you solve this game and you are at 100% uh, in the Atari suite. So one game is very hard to solve. Most of them are very easy. And for instance, those two game, Montezuma and Pitfall require exploration to, uh, to be solved. So why this last game is very, very hard to solve is because uh, if, you, if you want to, to look at it, you should look at the video. It's a game called Skiing, and basically it has a very weird reward function. You get a reward only at the end of the game. And uh, so uh, because of that, you need to understand that you, you need to solve a lot of small problems and you don't have information that you have solved those problem before the end of the game. So uh, this is what we call credit assignment. And this is a very difficult problem in reinforcement learning. So you really have to understand why uh, solving those small games relate to solving the problem at the end. And that's why it's a very, very difficult problem. Uh, yes, I mean, that, that's pretty much it in terms of um, presentation. I've, I've, I've done like this little tour on uh, what has been done so far uh, since 2015 in terms of uh, DQN-like algorithm. So if you have questions, I'll be uh, very happy to, to take them. Uh, thank you, Bilan, for this uh, fantastic uh, lecture. Really nice to have uh, such a talk. Uh, so we, did a we have a few questions free currently. So the first one is, it was raised at the beginning of the talk yeah. uh, or in between. When are DQN approaches more suitable than policy-based methods? Mm, no, I, I will, uh, no, I will say that uh, they are uh, very, I mean, they are different, but also a lot of papers now are making the link between the two. So for instance, um, if, you don't, if you don't take the optimal Bellman operator, but uh, the evaluation Bellman operator, and then uh, instead of taking a graded step, you take a soft max step, then it becomes an actor critic uh, type of algorithm, really close to policy-based algorithm. So uh, I, I think that, I mean, there, there is a clear link between the two. Uh, so DQN is one extreme. If you take policy gradients, it's another extreme, but you have a lot of method in the middle. So for instance, you have an algorithm called modified policy optimization, MPO algorithm. That is one instance of uh, making the link between the two. Matthew Guest, uh, just after me, will do a presentation on uh, those algorithms, uh, by the way. So uh, uh, stay tuned because it will show you uh, a lot of what we call uh, Cal regularized algorithm uh, that makes the link between uh, approximate value iteration, uh, policy, uh, approximate value iteration and policy improvement type of algorithm. So they are just two extreme of the same general algorithm. Yeah. Thank you very much for Alvaro. Uh, there was a question raised at some point. I'm not sure exactly to which slides it, uh, it refers to. It, it was about the curse yeah. of dimensionality. Yeah, yeah, uh, clear, clearly, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, maybe it's uh, when I was talking about finding uh, meaningful distance between states, uh, learning features. Um, 
So uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is a exactly. This is very, very hard to solve. Uh, so in the 2D case, it's uh, it's okay to solve. If you have uh, 3D images with partial view, uh, it's harder to solve. Uh, for sure, we need a better feature uh, learning uh, to solve that problem. The the fact that you have uh, a lot of states, a lot of possible states, uh, you also need to link uh, the different state to meaningful states. So either with uh, because those states help you solve a task, or because they help you uh, better understand the world. Um, you really need to uh, to have those what we call representation learning methods in order to fight this curse of dimensionality. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so Antonin Raffin is asking, Atari games are sold. What is next then? And do you think having such complex algorithm is the way to go? Yeah, so uh, Atari games are, uh, when we look at them now, they are, I mean, they are quite easy to solve uh, with, uh, with basic uh, deep learning architecture and uh, also a basic algorithm. So I, I don't think it's uh, uh, like we are done. Uh, uh, we have a lot of things to, uh, to, uh, to solve, like for instance, robot manipulation, locomotion is like very far uh, to be solved. Um, you have 3D, um, 3D world problems with partial view that are very, very hard to solve. Uh, most of exploration problems, even in Atari, they are not really solved convincingly. Uh, so we are better than the average human, but we are not better than the, the world champion on that game, for instance. Uh, so, so I think that the next uh, improvements are going not only to come from algorithm side, but uh, better architectures and also uh, representation learning. So how we, we, we are able to, uh, to get uh, the, the good uh, data uh, to train um, the good state representation. And on top, we can put uh, like any uh, RL algorithm. Yeah. So very, we are very far away to, uh, to have convincingly solved uh, what I was calling this morning the control theory problem. Thank you. Um, so we have three more, four more questions, and actually three more, no, four more. Yeah. So um, do you know Python library implementing every trick used by Agent 57? Oh, uh, Agent 57, uh, not yet. So you have the DQ and Zoo that implements most of the tricks. I mean, I don't I don't know if we need to call that tricks or not. I mean, I mean uh, they are, yeah, different methods, let's say. Um, so DQ and Zoo, uh, I've put a link uh, in my presentation. Unfortunately, uh, at the moment, we don't have uh, open source Agent 57, but we are working on it. Um, yeah, so soon you will be able to uh, run Agent 57. The only problem with Agent 57 is the fact that you will need a little bit more compute than uh, one GPU. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question is, uh, there are many models and ideas, but most of them uh, considered Atari game as uh, benchmarks. How can we classify these models and ideas? Sorry, in a way which, in a way uh, in which, uh, sorry. How can we classify these models and ideas in a way they are also appropriate for control benchmark or environments which have real world conditions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very good question. So maybe we have uh, overtuned our algorithm to the Atari benchmark. This is a yeah. I mean, uh, this is a, maybe a, a true statement. Uh, we we need to. Uh, I mean, we need to uh, run those algorithms on other benchmark. So there is the control suite benchmark out there. Um, the, the, there is the DM lab benchmark out there where you can basically take the code in DQ and Zoo and run it on all those things. Uh, I think it could be a, a nice paper uh, to do, uh, but you will need a lot of compute, unfortunately, to, to do those, those kinds of, uh, um, of uh, ablation. Uh, but uh, I think it could be, uh, could be useful. Uh, Maybe we need to publish that uh, because we have those scores internally. Uh, maybe we need to uh, do a full review of that and publish them 
so people can be uh, convinced that uh, those improve those improvements basically uh, transfer to other settings. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question: Are there any theoretical guarantees on why these ideas improve vanilla VQM? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. So you uh, uh, you need to uh, basically. Uh, um, so a theoretical. Okay. Theoretical. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, no, I, I, I'm not sure about theoretical. So okay. So um, I, I've not, uh, I didn't speak about those algorithms, but the Kale regularized algorithm that Matthew Guest is going to present, you have some guarantees that are better than DQN. So why they are better than DQN, those algorithms, is because instead of propagating the sub of the uh, regression error that you make at each step, they, they propagated the sum of uh, the errors and uh, not the absolute, not the sum of the absolute error, but the sum, the absolute of the sum of the errors. So the errors can basically uh, add and subtract themselves. So they are way better than a classical DQN algorithm where we don't have those bounds. So now concerning the improvement that I was speaking during the presentation, there is no uh, strong theoretical guarantees like a theorem that shows they are better than vanilla DQN. Uh, we have, uh, so we have uh, basically uh, experimental way to show that they are better. So for instance, uh, distributional RL has been shown to learn better features than DQN. Uh, but if you put a distributional RL algorithm uh, into a tabular uh, setting, you cannot prove that it is better to do that than vanilla DQN. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're nearing the end of the of the timing. So maybe... yeah, I can stay for five more minutes, no problem. Uh, ah, great. Thank yeah, you. No problem. So comment by Kirubel. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. So nice presentation. One quick question: Might a deep operationalization of emotions leverage the agent's motivation? Um. So uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe I would like to have more uh, more context into that question, uh, particularly the term operationalization of emotions. Uh, but maybe uh, Kirubel can uh, can add yeah, a, few, yeah. a few things on it while you you address but, another yeah. question. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Mauricio is asking, in your opinion, what is the best algorithm that has the best ratio between rewards and number of samples? So in terms of, uh, for example, best sampling efficiency. Yeah, so uh, yes, yeah, distributional or reinforcement learning are quite good at that because as I was saying, um, you, you are learning the, the full distribution. So naturally you are doing what we call auxiliary task. And uh, we have a very good experimental results when on top of classical RL, we had other tasks like uh, learning to predict the next frame or learning to do what we call pixel control. So to understand how an action uh, will modify the pixel in your image. So each time you have a, a task uh, that is natural on top of your RL algorithm, like understanding the dynamics, for instance, it improves the sample efficiency. Uh, so that's why distributional RL are like way more data efficient than uh, classical uh, DQN algorithm. Thank you again. Uh, so no news from Kirubel. So maybe the question by Nicola. Uh, yeah. Are the methods you presented <clears throat> uh, robust to the noisy TV problem? That is the yeah. agents attracted by state that are fully noise and every action yeah. uh, lead to an uncertainty, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, this is a very good question. So. Um, uh, when I present the never give up um, exploration, like very quickly, I'm sorry, maybe I, I went a little bit too fast. There, there is this way of basically learning the features uh, by predicting the actions. And when you do that, you extract a little bit the noise because the noise will never help you to predict the action between two, uh, two observations. So this is one way to uh, basically uh, robustify your algorithm and uh, get rid of the noise. 
So now, if uh, uh, you really want to get rid of the noise, uh, what you should do is not, for instance, uh, a prediction error type of method. You should use what we call model disagreement type of method. So model disagreements will take a bunch of models, try to predict the next frame, and then we'll uh, uh, see how much the model disagree. Okay, if the model uh, 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 don't disagree, you can have noise or not noise. Uh, they don't disagree. If they disagree, it means that uh, there is interesting information. So uh, model disagreement will be able to solve the noisy TV problems, for instance. Thank but you. not uh, prediction error. Yeah. Okay, so Kiruba uh, made some uh, added some precisions to his questions. The question, initial question was, might a deep operationalization of emotions leverage the agent's motivation? And the precisions are like encoding fear through punishment yeah, okay, okay. for rewards. Mm -hmm. I see the question. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, this is uh, okay. I understand now. Um, this is a little bit what we are trying to do with what we call intrinsic motivation. Uh, it's to create a signal um, uh, that basically it's uh, maybe a surprise or what you want to call it delight. Uh, but now through, through rewards, I think rewards uh, encode. So it's a very uh, complex topic uh, that I'm not uh, very uh, familiar with and I should not say uh, too much on it because uh, I'm not like an expert on uh, uh, punishment and the difference between punishments and reward. I know that there is a literature on that, uh, that that may uh, lead to uh, different behaviors. At the moment, uh, we only uh, use as feedback uh, what we call rewards. But yeah, uh, uh, I, I do understand that uh, you may want to do that. Um, the only thing we are adding on top of uh, the external reward, uh, and also having an external reward is also a huge debate in the reinforcement learning uh, literature. Maybe we, we only need to create our own reward, uh, and our own reward will be about, I don't know, understanding the world and that type of things. So it's still a debate. So I don't have any clear answer to that question, but it's a very good uh, question. Yeah. So thanks for uh, Ben. Um, do you want to take another question and maybe yeah. in there? Yeah, let, let's finish the question. Yeah. Okay, so earlier in the school classes, we had examples about the behavior of the agent when the rewards were split or modified to mimic human-like patterns like chronic pain, laziness. Okay. All these have been tried in the Atari setting. Uh, not that I'm aware of, so maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Uh, Ashraf is asking concerning prioritized uh, ER. I was wondering if it was a good idea to use an attention network to sample important samples. So, mm -hmm. okay, so, uh, so, okay. Uh, so what do you mean by attention, attention network? Uh, a network that stands, uh, state that it has never seen because I mean, the term attention is very uh, loaded nowadays because we have all those transformers and things like that. So attention, uh, I'm not sure the, if, what do you mean by the word attention? Okay, so maybe Ashraf, you can uh, add a detail. And uh, Celeste, sorry for the, Oh, sorry for the pronunciation. If we have a varying length of observation, for example, in NLP problem, can we still use DQM? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you can see your image as basically a one dim dimension uh, table that is very, very long. Uh, so, uh, but if you have a good way to uh, basically uh, uh, compute the information in that very long array, so in our case, we, we, we don't use an array, we use 2D because we have convolutional network. So it's just a way, if you have the correct architecture basically to, uh, to look at your data, your very long uh, data, so maybe a transformer, why not? Then why, yeah, if you want to use DQN on, uh, on, or, uh, on a, a dialogue task, I know that uh, a lot of RL techniques have been used for dialogue. So 
for NLP. Uh, so you you can definitely use uh, reinforcement learning in NLP. NLP, yes. Great. I think you also answered Bahar's questions. Would the QNR experience be suitable for real time dialogue? Yes. So okay. So real time dialogue. Uh, yes. So uh, so Florian Strub has done a paper called Guess What. So I, I think if you uh, type Guess What plus uh, Florian Strub in Google, you will have a paper that describes a very nice uh, a dialogue system that is trained with RL. Uh, so you could look uh, into that paper. Thank you. So